going there at the bottom. So today's topic again is customer service in government. Now let's do a little bit of a qualifier here. Um, all the rage is customer experience. So there's, if we're going to use acronyms, CS, customer service, CX, is customer experience. So here's what this means in the year 20, 2021. Uh, if I go to City Hall to get a business license or perform a transaction and I go in and the person is nice to me and handles my documents and hands it all back and I leave, I'll go, great, that was good customer service. Mm -hmm. Customer experience is, was it easy to find a place to park? Was there background music when I walked in? Was I greeted by the security host when I walked in? Was there trash on the floor? Was the directional signs available to help me find? So, you know, what's the experience of doing business somewhere as opposed to just the service? And we're going to talk about both today. But as a generalization, just know that we know that there's customer service and customer experience. And we want to kind of do that. So one more time before we get started, um, do me a favor. Go out there, everybody. And... Um, Type in where you're watching us from. If you're on Facebook or you're on LinkedIn, just type in the city, the town that you're watching us from so we can we can sort of get started and share some information with you. Okay, let's talk about our history. Okay. I worked at Disney, as you all know. Michael, you worked at both Marriott, Home Depot, and Lowe's. Kim, you've got a background at Coca-Cola and Starwood. So we've been inundated with customer service lessons in our history. So Michael, share a little bit about your background, both in retail and hospitality, and how you try to bring some of that customer service uh, into local government. You know, Pete, uh, I'd have to say the hospitality really set me into the customer service arena. Uh, I started with Marriott in, in my first management job, my first uh, true experience in customer service. And Marriott, um, set the standard for me that I carried on to Home Depot and Lowe's and I brought a lot of Marriott there. I still carry a lot of Marriott, but um, they just, they trained me well because they let me know that the customer is the most important person uh, and I, I am here to serve. You know, Bill Marriott had a, had a book that he wrote, Spirit to Serve, and we really when I started back in 1997, that was the big point, the spirit to serve. So it was something that we had within us that we wanted to serve people. So the the whole customer service piece, I, I grew up with that and it has just bled over in every job that I've had. And I think that it still works today. When, when I'm facilitating, when I'm training, I still go back to that first thing and I've just grown that customer service through my career. Yep. And when you say the word service, you know, the spirit to serve and service, we all work in civil service. Like it's a part of who we are is to provide service to our citizens. So I like that idea of the spirit to serve. Hey, our buddy Guy is watching from the personnel board. There he is, Guy. Good to see you. Appreciate that. Kim, tell us a little bit about, about um, your background in, in customer service. So my background is pretty similar to Michael's. I started um, well, really customer service when I worked for Verizon years ago, and it was actually AirTouch Cellular in Michigan. Okay. And I think there was such a huge pu push, excuse me, um, for customer service and us being number one. And how can we be number one and differentiate ourselves from all these other new cellular organizations? And the push was customer service mm -hmm. and how can we you know again differentiate ourselves and starwood hospitality really helped me to put all that into practice when i got there because it was all about the guests yep. and they have choices they can go to any hotel they can go to a marriott they can go to a hilton but what makes them want to come to the western and sleep in our heavenly bed you know, or put on our heavenly shower. So it was just all about customer service, but we, you know, the guest experience. Yep. And what would, you know, word of mouth and making sure when they leave that they're talking about us, but at, that it's a positive, right. in a positive way. And that's, yeah, again, to, to get people to talk about your organization or talk about you positively and share the good right. experience. Because we know the old story, you know, bad customer service, two people tell two people, tell two people and right. all that. So so let's make the shift now. All, all three of us are passionate about service, customer service, customer experience. We're trying to bring that into our world as, as trainers and leaders in local government. 
So again, I've been here for about 15 years now. Michael, you're coming up on uh, both of you between five and 10 years. And so trying to, to, to kind of bridge this gap. And that's the first question I want to ask all of our watchers. Go and Persephone's here, Crystal's here. So glad you all are here. If you're watching us live, go ahead and type in the comments of your live stream. What's the biggest customer service struggle you're facing as an employee uh, in your city or in your agency? Or even if you're watching us and you don't work in local government, what's your struggle? Because I've got three of these barriers here that I want to talk about and see if any of these apply to you. So the first thing that I always hear working in local government is, well, we don't have to give that great of service because we're a monopoly. Where else? <laughs> right are people going to go? I got bad customer service at Birmingham City Hall. So next time I'm going to go to Fairfield. Well, no, you can't. You don't live in Fairfield. <laughs> you don't live in Fairfield. I got bad customer service at the county courthouse. So I'm going to go to this one. No, you can't. This is it. So, so we stand back and we say, it doesn't matter if I give good service or not, because I'm the only game in town. How do we counteract that? How do we, how do we overcome that, Michael? Well, I, I really believe that the way we overcome it is we put ourselves in the in the uh, citizens' shoes, uh, and, and rather than I'm the only one in town, let me be the best one in town. I oh, uh, love it. You know, so I've I've got to change. Really, I've got to change the attitude of of the place I work. Not necessarily just my attitude. I want to change that too, but change the attitude of the place that I work that I want to be the best place rather than I'm the only place. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Kim, that's a great example. What else can we do for the employees to get them to buy into the fact that it, that pe people can go somewhere else if they want to, or how do we overcome that? Well, and you know, it, it was coming from the private sector to the public sector that that's very eye opening for me because, you know, that was what we pushed is, we don't want people going anywhere else. We want them to come to our hotel. Mm -hmm. We want them to continue to keep Coca-Cola as the number one brand in the world. Mm -hmm. But coming to government, yeah, we are. I mean, who else are you going to get your license from? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that we want, we don't want to have this negative brand with our citizens. And that, y'all, oh boy, let me get ready. Let me, you know, get ready because I'm going to get my license and it's probably going to be a fight. Yeah. And, you know, bad attitudes. And right when I get to the to the window, somebody going to lunch. And, yep. But yep. instead of them being prepared for the bad attitude or the argument or you got to go and no, you can't come back to the front of the line. How do we change our their perception? How do we help them with our brand? Yeah. And the way we do that is by offering great service, right. offering our citizens good service, just because it's our brand, first of all, this is my personal brand, but right. also the organization that I work for, I don't want us having this awful reputation with our citizens yep. that pay our bills, right? So. Yep. And you're, I mean, you're, you're tying right in there to this idea of, of, of the second barrier, which is the, the perception, you know, um, Taria writes on here that privatization is real. Government employees should not have that mentality. And so, yeah, that's going back to the monopoly thing for a minute. I think there's two things we can do. One is not to scare our employees, but outsourcing is real. Uh, hey, you don't, you know, you, you don't do a good job in police dispatch. Well, we can outsource that to somebody else. Right. Hey, you don't do a good job in general services or housekeeping. And we'll outsource that to somebody else because why would I pay for all your, so that's a, that, that's a hard lesson. If, Hey, you better do good or we're going to downsize or outsource. I'm not sure that's the message, but that's a reality of it, of that. The other thing is from a, a monopoly perspective of, of us always saying, well, they, they can't go anywhere else. Some people can go somewhere else. We're going to talk in a minute about businesses, uh, development. If they have a bad experience at City Hall, I'm going to take my small business to a neighboring city. I'm going to take my small business to a neighboring community yeah. because I don't like dealing with you people. And that means that house prices go down, property values go down, right. revenue goes down. So we have to somehow get out of this mindset. And Kim, Kim, you nailed it with the whole perception. Um, you know, why do people perceive? And let me ask Michael now too. Why do you think, why does the general community perceive that they're going to have a bad experience when they interact 
with local government? And that may be a stereotype and may or may not be true, Michael, but why do you think that exists? You know, I really think it's because we, we are known to have long lines. We're known that when we get to a when we get to the front of the line, somebody's going to put up a little sign that says it's my break time. Uh, <laughs> in, government, in government, I have to go to break at this specific time and you've got to choose the next window. Um, another thing is, is I'm not trained to to read the signs up the on the way to the counter. So when I get to the counter, I don't have the right forms and then they're going to make me feel bad, make me go to the end of the line because I don't have the right forms. Uh, and so it, long lines, the long wait, and then I'm going to have a, an attitude possibly when I get to that interaction that, that is not positive. And yeah. I, I see it from both sides because we really get tired of the same mistakes over and over and over because we don't look at each person as an individual. We yeah. look at the as next. Right. It's, yeah. it's just serving number, whatever the next number is, rather than a human being in front of us. And don't forget, y'all, I mean, government lives with rules, regulations, policies, procedures, right. and laws, most of the time to protect the employee, to protect the business, to protect the customer. When you're dealing with a Coca-Cola, a Southwest Airlines, a Marriott or whatever, there may be policies in place, but they're gray. There may be procedures in place, but we can make exceptions. And so part of the thing around us, I mean, and we, we, we always go back to the car tag example because those people in our Department of Revenue work so hard. But when someone comes up and their paperwork isn't completed correctly from CarMax or a car dealership, and we, we can't empower ourselves and go, you know what, we'll just let this slide this time. Because legally, you can't, can't do that. So the laws and the policies, right, put a little bit of a, of a barrier in place. And Michael, you went down this path and Kim, I'm going to ask you about this just in general, not just in government. We as human beings, as citizens have higher expectations than we used to around time, around efficiency. So do you think that the customers that want to do business in government have the same, I got to get in, I got to get out. I want it fast. I want it quick. I want it efficient. Are their expectations unrealistic? Do you think in the year 2021? Not, not at all. I think that, you know, they have the same expectations that we all do and that we our time is very precious, very valuable, and we just don't have time for a long process or, you know, to stand in line or whatever. We just don't have time. Everything has sped up. <laughs> Everything for it to be good, it's fast, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, so people want things fast, but they also want quality and they also want great service. Mm -hmm. I think it's up to us as, um, you know, government employees to manage their expectations. How do we do that? By providing them great client, I mean, not client, but great citizen service. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and COVID again, has been horrible for many of us based on family members and all that. But COVID did force us to think creatively, especially around customer service. I know, Absolutely. I mean, remember all these city halls and courthouses and places were shutting down and saying, you can't come in and do business. That forced them to say, back in the day, we could never do it by mail. We can never create a website. We can never, and now they were exactly. forced. They were forced, right, to think of new ways to do it. So in a way, has that sort of helped, Michael? Has has COVID forced us, talking about our department, oh, we don't do online learning. We don't do online training. Well, it forced us to say, yes, we do. So has that been a good thing, do you think? I think so. I think it just broadened our vision of what we can do as opposed to what we can't do. Yeah. You know, it's taken away that that old stigma of we can't do it that way because we never have, or that we do it this way because right. this is the right. way we do it. Uh, so it has opened uh it's opened our view to what we can do. And I think since you brought this up, I think it has opened a brand new opportunity for us to explore ways that we can, we can exceed expectations rather than just going back down into that, um, that ditch that we used to be in that we all just got into the trench and we just moved along. Uh, now we can just ex make that ex those expectations, meet those expectations in a variety of ways. Yeah. That, can really be wonderful for our constituents, for our customers, for our citizens. 
Absolutely. And I want to thank everybody for watching today. Again, we're on Facebook Live and LinkedIn Live. So if you're watching on LinkedIn Live, I apologize that I didn't change the logo above my head. <laughs> it's our first time going on, on LinkedIn Live as well. Maybe our last because they're going to ban us for putting that logo up there. But um, all right. So great ideas. And uh, I had a couple things I saw here. Um, uh, Crystal said when we we're talking about the idea of laws and rules and regulations, she said, yes, that's a real thing. But is it helpful and is it help motivate the employees? Doesn't that help to kill morale? We have to find as leaders and managers, I think, in local government, how can we empower our employees to provide excellent service without bending or breaking laws, rules, regulations, policies? That can be as simple as a follow up phone call. Right. Or even trying to say things like, I'm sorry you had to wait so long. Little baby things like that uh, kind of help, I think. So, yes, it. the worst thing we can say, I think, in government is, I'm sorry, we can't. The law says we can't. The policy says we can't. Well, I know what you can't do, but tell me what you can do. I love you. Let's go. <laughs> like, we plan, like we plan that or something. All right. Let's take a second here and talk about Disney again, because I'm a nerd and that's where I used to work. But let me go ahead and share this for a second with you because everybody always talks about Disney will never work in local government. Disney will never work. You, you can't do Disney in local government. Well, there's this. Let me pull this down. Uh, governing magazine, governing.com. Uh, did an article recently on uh, Arlington, Texas, and we'll make sure we tag you in this Arlington, Texas, when we post it back up there um, about how they're getting out of the it's our way or the highway mentality. And they're getting into trying to create a, a service culture in their planning division. So you can go to governing.com, look this up if you work in, in local government and pull up Disney's customer service model. But one of the things that they mentioned that I, here's a couple of things that they mentioned that I want to run by by the two of you. They said that an ambassador was chosen from each office division, whether it's an engineer, a building inspector, an administrator, to help lead the culture change among their colleagues, to speak on behalf of the customer service initiative, and to go back and forth and relay concerns. What do y'all think about the idea of, if you're going to roll out a customer service culture, you truly have to have ambassadors or boosters, or you know, how can we use those people, Michael, if we, if we get like, because we call it a committee. Let's get a customer service committee together. I like the idea of ambassadors or boosters, maybe. Would that work? I think so. I think it's a necessity because what, what we're doing, and I think it'd be a great idea for the peers to choose those people. Oh, you're looking for you're looking for somebody that has the passion that really wants to make that experience great. Uh, and somebody that does it the majority of the time. Nobody's going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be 100% of the time. But that person that comes in, most of the time that's joyful, that's pleasant, that provides outstanding customer service, you want them to be your ambassador. You want them to, to lead from the front and be the example and they can go around and, and cheer people up. And when, when you have a bad day, you want those guys to, to be there to back you up. If you're having a bad day, they can slide right in there for you without making you feel bad and help you through that process. So I think it's a, an incredible idea to have ambassadors uh, jump in there and, and really take a lead. Yep. I like that. Kim, also in the article, they talked about the idea of um, letting small businesses um, put up a display in City Hall for one week. And that you say, hey, for free, you want to put up a display? And then all of a sudden, they're like, wow, that's great customer service. And I'm getting more business because you're allowing me to advertise for free and all that. You know, so this idea of service as almost um, letting other people market and do PR sure. about their businesses through government. Is that something you think might might work? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing I loved about this article is they, they had a plan. And I think for any of this to work, you need yep. to plan it out really well because again, you're taking Disney and saying, how does Disney's customer service fit into government? And I love that idea of allowing the businesses to advertise. Um, I think it would work yeah. again at no cost to them. Free advertisement within government. Yeah. Heck yeah. Because think about all the customers that are coming through. The citizens are coming through. They're going to see the business. And the thing to remember is this is our city. This is our you know, jurisdiction. Uh -huh. Whatever. We take pride in our businesses and those that are in our jurisdiction. 
And so this is a great way to showcase those businesses and show yeah. that we as government, we support these businesses. Yeah, nobody can do it by themselves. We have to have, yeah. we absolutely have to have our partners. All right, well, people who are watching, they're like, this is great. I'm glad you guys are talking, witty banter, all that. Give us some ideas. <laughs> Stop talking about what we should, give us some ideas. So we've got some ideas. We've we got three ideas here that we're trying to do here throughout Jefferson County, Alabama, and also some ideas that, that kind of tie in. So they're not easy, but these, these might work. So number one is, You've got to build a customer first culture of government services. Now, let me tell you how I interpret that. I interpret that to mean that everything we do, everything we put together, everything we design is with the end result of the customer. Yes, there's yes. laws, regulations, policies, but how can we make it for the customer? Yes, the employees want this. Now, this is different from the customer is always right. This is different from the customer is first and the employee is second. I'm not talking about that, y'all. I'm talking about when we build processes, everything from the parking lot to if I'm a customer and walking into City Hall, what do I expect it to look like? What do I expect it to smell like? Uh, where do I expect directional signs to be? If I'm doing a fire response or a police response, what's when I get out there and interact with my customer, what are some of the expectations? So to, to think of it as building everything as customer first, I think is important. So I'll throw that out to, to like either of you. What else can can managers, employees, frontline employees do in government to to always be thinking customer first as I design this process? Well, I you know as, as I think about this again, how can we make their experience when they walk into the building? What is their experience like now? Of course, you're going to walk in, you got to be patted down, you got to surrender your purse and all right. that. And go through. I mean, it's just got to happen. But after that process, what what could happen after that, that made them feel good or, um, you know, make them feel like, OK, you're not a criminal. We, 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 we're glad you came to visit us. This is just a process that we have to go through. Um, but what is it when they walk into a particular office? Um, I went to an office in Jefferson County and they had candy at the front desk. Mm -hmm. This okay. is pre-COVID though. But right. having peppermint and, you right. know, having pens that people are allowed to take and they're not, you know, stuck to the desk. With, with, a, with, with a chain. With <laughs> a chain, yes. Right, right. absolutely. Right. Like, are you scared you're going to steal it? So we're going to chain it down. No. But we have pens. We want you to take our pens. We want you to take the mints. And the the smell is good when you walk in. Oh, is, Kim, Michael. There's Kim some Robert. music. Oh. Yes. Oh. All our sensory. Yeah. You know, there's some good music. And yeah. our people are in a good mood. I, yeah. rem, I you know, reading the, di the um, Disney article when yeah. she talked about the first step was how do we get our people to be in a good mood? Yes, because when they're in a good mood and they feel like they're taken care of and they're we are concerned about them as employees, they're going to take care, hopefully, of our guests. Yep. So how do we help them be in a good mood? How do we have stuff in the break room, breakfast, donuts, whatever? You can't afford to do that all the time. <laughs> preaching. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we take care of our people? Yeah. For me, is I want to take care of our employees yeah. because if we take care of our employees uh, and make sure they feel like they're yeah. not just another butt in the seat, yeah. then they are going to take care of the employee, the, the customers, the citizens. Michael, you are you income. buying? Are you buying? I'm, I'm buying 100%. Yeah. 100%. Right, the, the, uh, you know, I. I uh, that's just a lot. The, the the next level that I would take, you know, I'm a I'm a real big believer in the small little things. So as I, as I'm building a culture, I don't care what position you're in. I don't care whether you are the the key holder to the best office in the building to the the last person that walks in. Pick up the area that you're walking in. Make sure that your area is attractive. So remove all the trash, but everybody's involved in that. So making your area attractive, make sure it's clean, make sure it's inviting to build that culture. 
And I'll tell you what, the, the, the person with the most power or the person that has the highest position, when they see you bend over and pick up a piece of paper or a can that's laying down, you just built a culture right there with that one action right. that 10 people are going to follow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's what I think of. Do all the stuff that, that Kim was just preaching about, <laughs> and then the little things, yeah. you know, all of the centuries, because we see that. Yeah. If I drive up somewhere and there's trash in the parking lot, there's trash at the entrance doors, that lets me know that I'm I'm not well kept on the outside. I'm probably not well kept on the inside. So, so there's so there's two ideas, Kim's, which is employee first culture. Make sure your employees are motivated and inspired and have a good place to work. That'll translate to the customer. Michael's talking about the show element, the Disney show and picking everything up, making it look good. I'll throw one more out there, which is, and I think, I think Walmart used to do this back in the day. It was called the six foot rule. I think that if, if, if a Walmart employee came within six feet of a, of a customer, they had to recognize them and say, hello, good morning. We have so many people in our government offices that are just going to work and going to the council meeting and going here and going there and just passing uh, uh, Imagine if part of your service culture was it's a non-negotiable expectation that if you pass a citizen in this building, you say hello, you say good morning. I don't care what your role. You would imagine by the time they got to their office, they're like, wow, every single person, every <laughs> single person that I came in contact with said hello and good morning. That That's one way to just take some of the edge off for the people who are coming in. All right. Number two, y'all, I told you we give you a couple. Efficiency. And we'll start with Michael on this one. Government, again, gets a bad rap for file cabinets. And in the year 20, <laughs> sometimes I go out and speak to other government agencies and I'll, I'll say, raise your hand if you have more than three file cabinets in your office. I'm like, more than five, more than 10. Someone goes, we got 16 file cabinets. And I'm like, why do you have oh, 16? Like, have? They're like, first we have to scan it. Then we have to input it. Then we have to save it. And they've got to write on it. So, Michael, talk about how we can make, be more efficient and quick. We want to be right and we want to be accurate, but most people are looking for efficient transactions. How can we do that? You know, I'm, I'm going to stay real, real simple and I might get a little bit cheesy here, but I'm just going to tell you, if you, if we want customer interaction and we want to be efficient, start with a smile. Gotcha. You know, you don't even have to say anything yet, but start with a smile. Let them see that you're smiling. And then ask the question, how can I make your day amazing? Mm -hmm. First of all, you'll have to pick them up off the floor because they're not used to any government <laughs> employee saying, how can I make your day amazing? But smile at them, greet them like Pete was just talking about. In that six to 10 foot area, hi, how are you? If you're able, I know we have a lot of lines, so we wait till they get to that three foot area maybe. Yeah. But how may I make your day amazing? And they're going to be shocked, but then they'll really tell us, they'll probably get to the core of the matter. And that's where, where the efficiency comes in. Yep. Let me help you with this problem and let's move to the next. But because I, I asked directly, why, how can I help make your day amazing? They're going, I wasn't prepared for this. Let me just get to it. Then we can move on. But Okay, Most so, of the time, they're, they're already defensive. They're ready for a battle. That's what's probably in their mind. So you start with a smile to take the defenses down, ask the question how to make their day amazing. Efficiency comes in, and we're good to go. So the in-person stuff and the smile you're talking about, that's the simple part. That's just a, right. and that leads into the efficiency. So, again, Kim, what do you think about efficient processes? How do we make – what is it technology? Is it apps? You know, because because like Michael said, we're going to start off the process with this simple. How can I help you? What is your one need today? What some other things we can do or, or, or we can start thinking about? Maybe. Well, I think it goes back to what we said earlier that COVID um, showed us when we you know, the, everything was shut down. We had to think of new ways and be innovative. And we had to um, engage technology. And I think government is always lagging and slow when it comes to implementing technology, okay. um, but it's needed. We have to have it and making sure that technology and there are options. And yes, an app would be absolutely wonderful. 
And I, I love the fact that now you are able to renew your license online. Yep. And there are some things that you can do online. But what are some other things, what are other processes that we can, you know, instead of it's paper and pencil, can we not make it efficient online? Mm -hmm. And also making sure that we explain our processes. I think a lot of times our the, cusp, the citizen gets kind of frustrated and the employee gets frustrated yeah. because we know our process, yeah. but we expect the citizen to know our process right. and they don't know our process. Yeah. And it's like, why do we even have this process? And why are there 30,000 steps in this one process? So technology and also making sure that we take time to explain our processes to the citizen because assuming that they know them is a big mistake and, and that's it just a, a lot of frustration on both ends that's a great point so if you're watching this i want you to be thinking about what's the one process that most of your citizens complain about what's the one process that they say this could be made a lot easier take that go to a room one day with a few of your frontline employees or the manager or whatever and write it out and say well can we eliminate this step can we right. eliminate why do we have to have seven signatures can we have three signatures why do we have to so again thinking through that to try to help them make it more efficient i think is huge um and Pete, one more, i'm go sorry ahead. Yeah, go ahead. well and i was thinking a lot of times we need to revisit those processes like you said because we've done you know this is what needed to be done like 15 years ago or 10 years ago but now things have changed and now you don't require, you know, it's not required to have all this, but we haven't gone back and revisited it. Nope. So we're still requiring this. And it's just, again, it's a tedious process that is just very frustrating to our citizens. And I touched on this really quickly, but let's spend a few minutes on this last one. Um, I think the third idea, because we, we talked about um, customer first culture, we talked about being more efficient working with the current employees who are on the front lines. Let me be very specific about this one. Sure. Who are, you know, on there to understand their needs. Because a lot of times what will happen is the police chief, the fire chief, the deputy director will create a policy or a process or something and say, here's what you implement. Why is it so important to bring the frontline employees in and say, you're the ones dealing with this every day. What are some of your ideas to improve customer service? How can we do that? And why should we do that, Michael? Well, first of all, because the people on the front lines are the people getting the job done. They're the ones that are they're having the most interactions with our customers, with our citizens. If we don't get buy in from the front line, it, it's not going to work, period. I mean, you can only do so much by pouring from the top before everybody on the bottom drowns. So, yep. there you know, go. you know, that that first person you get buy-in from that, let them lead from the front position yeah. and you're going to be successful all the way up. So it, it may be your idea at the top and let the front lead, let that front front end employee lead the way and set the example and, and get buy-in and their ideas are usually very, very good because they deal with that day in and day out. And they're going to have the most current ideas. They're going to know what the biggest challenges are and you can confront that and move on. Kim, I'm going to put you on the spot here with the word how. So, I mean, Michael's right. Let's get the frontline people's ideas. Let they're the ones doing it. But if I'm the supervisor, give me some how. How do I get their ideas? Do I do a suggestion box? Do I ask them once a year during their performance appraisal? Do I do a round table? There may not be a right or wrong answer. What do you think is a good way to collect some of this data? Well, it, it, when you, as soon as I heard you say the word how, I was the first word that popped in my mind is just ask. <laughs> asking them, just asking them, you yeah. know, what do you need? What? are your needs i think a lot of time we assume what they need so we just give them what we think they need yeah. but a lot of times we don't just simply ask yeah what do you need to provide great service to our citizens today yeah. and so is that in a stand-up meeting morning is that um you know having a a i, I would get them all together but it's just simply asking what do you need yeah. And sometimes even getting in there with them and experiencing it for yourself. 
Um, because a lot of times as supervisors and managers, yes, we are busy with the other work, but sometimes we need to just go back to our, to that front line and just work it yeah. and experience it. And then we're able also to determine some needs because we've worked in it and we know it. But also, again, just asking the employees, letting them know we're concerned about you and we want to provide you. We want to set you up for success. Yep. You and represent I, us. And I want to give, give my two cents on this, too, which is managers need to check their egos at the door every day, because a lot of times that's the fear. I don't want to ask the employee for a, an idea. It might be a good idea. And then one of two things is going to happen. I'm not going to implement it because I didn't come up with it and I don't want because then people will say, why do we need you? Or I'm going to implement it, not give them credit. That causes a morale issue. So I might. Right. So we need to check our egos and go, I work okay. with these people. They don't work for me. We're a team. you know. So part of that employee morale thing you talked about is any idea is a good idea. And we, and we can't be the chief, the, the deputy director, even the manager who goes, I'm the only one who knows how to do it. You know around here that can just crush everybody in fact um crystal says talk you were talking earlier about employee engagement you know th there's a lot of facts in what we're talking about today but we're sometimes treated like we're at the bottom of the barrel you know so we can talk this all day but none of this is going to work until our final thoughts y'all and this is our final thought so perfect segue there crystal is management's role in this customer service customer experience culture um i'll start with my two cents they can't just expect it to happen. You can't just go to your employees and say, we expect good customer service. What does that mean? You know, what, what are your non-negotiables? What are your things that I'm going to be written up for? How am I going to be held accountable? So management's role is, is, is to be very specific on what excellent customer service looks like. And again, it's also, in my opinion, holding people accountable who are not doing it. Because what happens, and you guys know this, we're both getting paid the same because we've talked and we know, or heaven forbid, you're getting paid more than me and I don't see you doing this. Well, why should I, why should I bust my butt? I'll just, I'll just lower, you know, I'll just lower my, because no one's holding anybody accountable. I'm working harder, all this kind of stuff. So, so one of my things is holding people accountable and also sharing everything. What else do managers need to do? What else? And, and again, you all can type that as this is our last comment, go into Facebook, go into LinkedIn live and type in, what is the role of a manager in in encouraging a customer service culture? What are your what are your thoughts, Michael or Kim? I'll let you jump on that. Well, so. I would say be what you expect. Um, you know, be the example. Uh, provide good customer service to your employees. Show them, model the way. Yeah, I think modeling the way yep. will help them to see what your expectations are. Model the way. So you can't tell them, treat this person like this and make sure you smile. But every day you walk in with a frown, right? Yep. You, you, nobody can say anything to you because your attitude. So making sure we model the way and then put a plan in place. I like, again, when I read that article, she put a plan in place and it wasn't just, you know, posting I care on the wall, but introducing it and saying, we're going to do one a month. You know, we're not going to force it all down your throat and yeah. give you a pen that says I care and all that. But what does that really mean? And making sure that we digest that once a month, yeah. making sure that the employees really grasp it, understand it. Then we move on to the next one. So model the way and then also put a plan in place. And the plan, man, I mean, again, you're not going to change a customer service culture in 40 hours or two no weeks. Way. If you're, no I mean, way. It's going to be a six, nine, 12 month. And especially if there's new mayors being elected or election cycle or all that. So you've got to have a long term plan. Michael, what do you what do you think? But you got to be committed. Sorry, Michael. Being committed <laughs> to the process. Because no. it's going to be long. Go ahead, yeah. Michael. It's going we're, to be long. Talking, we're all talking the same thing. You know, it's pretty simple. Game on every day. Game yeah. on. Uh, I, I heard this in a Motivation Monday or or some chat that i heard not too long ago a leader doesn't get to take a day off you've got to be on 24 7. and you know so game on every day don't just create the culture be the culture yeah. so when you show up if you want that culture then you're acting that way all the time uh, right. and 
you know, when, when you do that, you're going to look around and you're going to see that the culture has become what you wanted it to be. But you've got to live that. It's got to be part of who you are. It's got to be your core. And and when you do that, then things will come in, in line. But to our point, it's going to take time. Don't think it just because I acted this way today, tomorrow, everything's going to be rainbows and daisies. Yep. yep. Be it's consistent. It's be consistent day in, day out. And don't take a day off. Come in and set that culture um, the way you want it to be. Because the employees are watching you. The citizens are watching Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I look, look what Guy says. Guy says, I think leaders should also serve in that frontline capacity every once in a while. Sh Absolutely. Get out and take a frontline shift. Answer yeah. the phone every now and then. Yeah. Go with the ride along with your, yeah, don't get out of your ivory tower if you really believe in this. Right in this customer service thing. Um, Natasha has joined us on Facebook Live, says model and provide support. Absolutely, you gotta model the way, but then you gotta support the employees support as well. Man, so that's our that's our final thought on that. Hey, this has been a good talk, y'all. Yes. I, I, I hope it's helped everybody be a little more excited about trying to provide customer service. We gave you some ideas. Tell your friends, trainer talks are every couple of weeks. Follow us on Facebook Live under Personnel Board of Jefferson County. Sometimes we'll put them on our individual LinkedIn pages as well, like we're doing today, um, which may or may not be appropriate. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> may just change that. But just trying to hit hit a lot of people. Uh, 30 seconds or less. Kim, Michael, final thoughts on uh, creating a customer service culture in local government. You know, we started off with, can we bring Disney into into this real cheesy, but well, you need to bring some Disney magic into the magic city. We can do that. I like that. We, Birmingham's known as the magic city. So well done. Well done. Kim, closing thoughts? I, I just think it starts at the top and it'll trickle down. So just, you know, make sure as supervisors and managers that we are modeling the way and yep. that we are supporting our employees not just uh, you know but supporting them in front of the client you know the citizen as well not oh it's michael's first day he's a loser he always makes mistakes i'll do it this time for, no but making sure we support them in front and in back and they feel supported they'll take care of our guests yep yep taria so, like taria likes what guy had to say about leaders taking I do too. Things, so that's good <laughs> my closing thought is this I'm sure we've got some people on here who aren't managers, some people out here who want to give customer service, who aren't being supported. My takeaway for y'all is, is you do you, you be you. Um, don't, don't stop being, you were raised and born a certain way with a culture of taking care of people or citizen service and all that, just because no one else is doing it and you're not being supported. Don't, don't shut it down. You know, still be the best version of you you can be. And maybe that modeling the way isn't going to come from the management team. It's going to come from the frontline peers who are now watching each other do it. So never get discouraged. Customer experience is something we all are going to keep working on every day. So Kim, Michael, thank you all so much. Everybody on both sides, thank you all so much. We'll do this again in a couple of weeks with a new topic. So have a great summer. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye-bye.